Hi everyone. In this lecture, we're going to continue to talk about art in China in the early part of the 20th century, especially focus on the rise of the Communist Party after World War II. At the end of World War II, the Japanese retreated from China and the Nationalist Party, which had been in power, uh, really was disorganized and collapsed uh, with the fresh onslaught from the Communist Army. And the Nationalists, the Guomindang as they were called, would retreat from Ch mainland China and decamp to the island off the coast of Taiwan. And so this important transformation is one, mainland China now becomes under the control of the Communist Party. And the Nationalist Party sets up government, really sort of takes over this island nation, which had been sort of semi-autonomous up to this point. China to this day continues to claim that Taiwan is within its sovereignty and that it is a rogue province. And so Taiwan has been kicked out of the United Nations so that China could be allowed in. And this is part of the sort of ongoing legacy of this tumultuous time at the end of World War II. The Nationalist Party, when it left for Taiwan, took with it a lot of the treasures and masterpieces that were in the imperial collections. And so today, many of the great works of art that were once the important legacy of imperial China is now found in Taiwan. So China got, and the Communist Party got a great deal of support early on from the Russian government, another communist power. And so from those large loans and from a massive restructuring of the economy in China, a great deal of the property and the factories were now socialized. They were put under a whole new, there was a great deal of land redistribution and there was a huge progress to lifting the poor out of the slums, improving their lives in the first 10 years. Then as the debts came due, China struggled and instead decided to default on its loans to Russia and go it alone. And this would be a kind of desperate uh, attempt to push the Communist Party into self-sufficiency. And this was known as the Great Leap Forward. This was an ideological move uh, promoted by Mao Zedong, who was still the leader of the party at this time, and he put forth this idea that all communist governments are actually just socialists. And this distinction is a, is a little bit hard to completely explain here, but the idea was that China was going to be the first country in the world to be truly communist in the sense that there would be no private property at all. Everything would be collectively owned. Everything would be collectively managed. Everyone would have an equal stake in the success of the country. And so people moved out onto farms and onto these communes and they lived and worked communally and they tried to completely re-engineer their economy. They asked people to recycle um, metals. Um, there was a kind of an ideological fervor of self-sufficiency that drove this. And because it was an ideological movement, there was a great deal of pressure for it to succeed. And any bad news or news about trouble was considered a kind of failure of people's faith in the Communist Party. And so these people were heavily criticized, and those people who were trying to raise urgent concerns were silenced. The Great Leap Forward 
was a huge catastrophe. It was an economic disaster. It was a humanitarian disaster. We don't know the exact full extent of the trouble launched by the Great Leap Forward, but conservative estimates are somewhere between 20 to 30 million people would die of starvation. This is a staggering catastrophe, and it is still not fully accounted for because the Communist Party has kind of turned a blind eye to this point in time. The Great Leap Forward really was uh, a terrible indictment of Mao Zedong uh, and his leadership. And he had become sidelined within the party and there were people who were maneuvering to try and kick him out. Mao had married uh, actress in Shanghai, his fourth wife, Jian Qing, and from southern China, uh, and among a, a number of, of ideological cadres on his side, he launched what would become the Cultural Revolution. And this all began uh, rather simply with a play that was produced in Beijing by the mayor of Beijing, uh, Wu Han, who produced this historic drama called Hai Jue, dismissed from office. This play sort of indirectly criticized the idea that the emperor was failing, and there was a sort of veiled attack on Mao as a kind of emperor who is out of touch with what the ordinary people are living and doing and that they need to have administrators who are willing to speak up against the emperor's um, misunderstandings. So the Cultural Revolution was this attempt to at first kind of reclaim the center of the party. And to do that, uh, Mao launched an ideological war against his critics. And Wu Han was sent off to prison and where he eventually would commit suicide. And the Cultural Revolution began a fierce attack on all the people who opposed Mao and his ideology. And he rallied these most ardent supporters, this young uh, paramilitary group called the Red Guard. We'll talk more about them later. This image I'm showing you here by Liu Chunhua, uh, Chairman Mao goes to Anyang, was one of the sort of major pieces of propaganda that was promoted at this time. Over 900 million copies of this poster were made by Liu Chunhua, and it was posted everywhere. Everyone knew what this meant. This was the young Mao marching on his way to the south of China to get involved with the miners' strike, and this was sort of the first pivotal success of the Communist Party, and here is Mao all on his own uh, with his umbrella, a symbol of his resourcefulness, his clenched fist, his determination, his clear-eyed vision, standing on the mountaintops, charging into history. Now, it's important to notice this is Mao is a fairly young man here. He was indeed at the time of the uh, minor strike, a fairly young man. But Mao, to, at the time that this poster was made, was already 75 years old. Uh, and so he didn't bear any resemblance to this young, striking young figure. It was meant to appeal this younger Mao to this sort of youthful, revolutionary vigor. And this was what people were supposed to come out and, and get behind the Mao that was this youthful, vigorous person who could willing to take on the world and transform it. In many ways, it's a very romantic image. It harkens clearly to Caspar David Friedrich's uh, idea of the wanderer above the sea, the sense of a visionary uh, individual uh, against the tide of history. And it's a way in which it appeals to this sense of a singular and unique individual who has this uh, power to change things. Another painting which came out 
uh, earlier uh, was Liu Shaoqi and the Anyang coal miners by Ho Yi Min. Now, Liu Shaoqi was another leader within the Communist Party who was a rival uh, along with Mao. And uh, this painting here would be criticized and ultimately destroyed because it represented a kind of false ideology. Here we see Liu Shaoqi surrounded by the miners and they're charging out of the mine, um, engaging in the strike. And here we see the sort of, you know, leader of, of the people in, in a very different kind of way. Someone sort of moving out into the world um, to make a difference. And it's a very different ideology about the Communist Party. And, and what we really see during the Cultural Revolution is that Mao stands alone. In the Cultural Revolution, nobody was allowed to stand next to or to have any of the glory aside from Mao. This could be typified in this uh, historic painting uh, called The Birth of the Nation, originally by Dong Xiaowen. Uh, originally painted in 1953, you see the top version where Mao is reading a proclamation of the Communist Party is now in control of China. Uh, and you see he's surrounded by all the party officials. You'll note if you look to the lower revised version that this group of people has changed. And indeed, that was some of the ways in which the Cultural Revolution was meant to weed out party officials who were not duly loyal to Mao, really erasing them from history. Uh, Liu Shaoqi uh, was removed at one point and then later uh, returned to Mao's favor and was put back in the painting. One of the ways in which Mao's propaganda and self-aggrandizement came out in these ubiquitous Mao badges. It's estimated anywhere between 2.5 to 5 billion of these badges were made in 27,000 different kinds of uh, designs. The majority of the images show Mao, as you see here on the right, clearly facing the left. And I want to point out quickly what that means. Uh, because the left here, of course, being a leftist is to be like a communist, is to be a true blood ideological communist. And to be a rightist is a person who holds on to the past and the kind of feudalistic ideas that got China and the imperial powers at be. And so those people who resisted change, people who resisted the ideas of the communist revolution, they were the rightists. And there were many of these sort of anti-rightist campaigns used to sort of ideologically weed out people who were not true blood communists. One of the chief campaigns of the Cultural Revolution was called the destruction of the four olds. Those were old ideas, old customs, old culture, old habits of mind. So this was not just a, an ideological attack uh, on, on, on sort of a few people who didn't think right. It was really about a history of China and everything that was old. And when you live in a country that has 6,000 years of history, there's an awful lot that needs to go away. And so this was a massive destruction of cultural property and cultural goods that were considered feudalistic. Now notice in this poster here, these young, um, urgent looking prolet uh, people of the proletariat, the, the workers, the students, the, the soldiers, the Red Guard, they're sort of violently throwing out what looks like a kind of crumpled gray bearded professor clinging on to his essays. I feel pity for him. Now, at the least that I resemble him. So the four olds were a difficult time for people who were uh, in authority. If you were a professor in front of a classroom, you might expect your students to revolt and to get a farmer off a tractor in the field and bring him in and say, we want to learn from the people. We're no longer going to learn these old ideas and these stodgy ways. So the universities you know, descended into chaos.
and people who were intellectuals and people who were any kind of cultural authority were heavily criticized. Artists who were not ideologically pure or have exactly the right message would be what's called self-criticized. This was a kind of personal torture where you were made to recant every one of your faults repeatedly and publicly and wear dunce caps and be paraded through the streets and humiliated by insults and shouts. This was a time when, as I mentioned, a great deal of cultural artifacts were burned. There were these sort of public burnings, these sort of mass destruction of all kinds of relics and artifacts. Many others just sort of quietly disappeared. People dug and buried things that they did not want to part with. Uh, and so there were people who sort of secreted away their treasures for another day. But those were the exception. And the vast majority of the country was overthrown and destroyed by communist zeal. The new art that was emerged focused again, primarily on Mao. Mao's achievements, here he is uh, in Yan'an uh, when the, Mao, the Communist Party was regrouping during World War II. And you see him here among the children in the front and the, and the young villagers beside him. Everything was meant to be red and bright and shining. You were not supposed to have any kind of um, muted colors. Everything was supposed to be intense and vibrant and happy. Remember what Mao said at Yan'an that there, everything must be positive. You need to move the proletariat. You need to move the common people and bring them to your banner through positive me messages about the revolution. One of the ways in which the communists took to insulting people of authority or through these uh, posters, these big character posters where people would write out in just beautiful calligraphy, uh, scathing insults, damning people who were uh, the government officials and the people who were not ideologically pure. And these proclamations, these visual posters, were incredibly powerful and humiliating people and shaming them. You did not want to see your name up in big, bold, red characters. And Mao was very particular. As you mentioned earlier, he understood the power of calligraphy. He understood the power of, and legitimacy that beautiful calligraphy gave to ideas. And so he insisted that all the characters and writings that were done from the Communist Party are given a kind of powerful calligraphy, a kind of indisputable truth about the beauty of the calligraphy that they created. Here you can see an example of some of the early big character posters at Peking University in 1966. Here's another example of art created at this time. Notice these bright red cliffs that sort of signal the ideological fervor. The artist would be, you know, demand that they present things that were clearly ideological. In this case, uh, Qian Songyan wrote, the two trees to the one side of the hall were joined to form a massive cypress canopy, symbolizing the faithful and pure revolutionary spirit. So it wasn't possible to create art that was just pretty. You had to have some kind of important, clear, symbolic message that was pro-communist. And this was something that had to be absolutely stated. You could not have any equivocation or subtlety. And all art that was not clearly revolutionary was banned. And anything that had been made of the past was also banned. So at this time, there was no theater. There was no movies. There was nothing you could make or do or allow to be shown until it was approved by the Central Party Commission. 
by Qian Qing, and she set to work to create what was called these model works, these works of art that were absolutely ideologically pure, that would show the rest of China exactly the kind of message that must be made during this time. One of these truly remarkable pieces was a ballet uh, by uh, the Beijing Ballet Company, Red Detachment of Women. In this uh, in remarkable ballet of incredible athletic skill, we see the story of these young revolutionaries who are fighting against the evil Japanese and the nationalists. And uh, they do this with this kind of intense vigor. Now, the Chinese had been trained in ballet from the Russians early on, but they took it to this new sort of heightened athletic ability with higher leaps, broader jumps, and everything they could do to make them this new kind of um, vigorous zeal. And you can see the kind of ideological vigor. Now, there is a link uh, to a f a some footage from the Red Detachment of Women. I highly recommend you look at this, and I will and comment on it later. Another model work that was created was called Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy. There were about nine model works made in their entirety. These were plays originally, then they were made into films, uh, footage from the Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy can be seen on uh, this link here, 1970. This was one of the last of the model works. A really exciting and vigorous portrait. These are great plays. They were really extraordinarily exciting to watch. That said, the message was always the Communist Party is fantastic and amazing and miraculous and Mao Zedong is our inspired leader. And even though Mao does not, of course, appear in any of these plays, his presence is often felt and songs are sung to him in praise of his great uh, work. And so we have in these model works the sort of framework for all other kinds of art that would be made from them. An example would be the Lian Huan Hua that were made prior to the Cultural Revolution might be on any variety of different uh, subjects. Now they were only made from the model works. And this was a way to kind of disseminate the impact of these model works to people and audiences that didn't have access to the movie theaters or staged play versions. These books were printed in the millions and disseminated all over China. The Cultural Revolution got out of hand pretty quickly, and Mao was forced to uh, call back the Red Guard that had gone into a kind of battle amongst each other. Different factions of the Red Guard claimed to be more ideologically pure than other factions, and so there were gun battles in the streets, and they were smashing everything without any regard. And so Mao told the Red Guard that they needed to go into the country and learn from the peasants to check their ideology against true working, class, working people. And so 12 million boys and girls who made up the Red Guard and many others besides went up to the mountains and down to the villages in order to be re-educated by poor lower middle peasants. And once they got into the countryside, their visas, their ID papers were taken away and they were stranded. A whole generation of kids in China were essentially abandoned in the countryside. And this was a huge, <laughs> to say least, disappointment um, as millions of kids realized they had been betrayed by the man they thought was their ideological leader. And from that, some escaped, some settled in, some committed suicide. Uh, there is a movie about this, which is not remarkably banned in China, Xiu Xiu, 
the sent down girl, which sort of addresses some of these issues about these kids and the struggles they have in the countryside. This painting here is a propaganda piece showing the girls as they have arrived in the village where they are going to be re-educated. You see them sitting there in the front row, all eager and excited to be learning uh, about the villagers. Notice how their feet prominently facing forward. Not a one of them is bound. So the end of the Cultural Revolution came with the death of Mao. There were several years toward the end of Mao's life when recriminations and fear and, and terror gripped the city as Mao proclaimed there were people who were um, trying to kill him and people were denouncing their neighbors, their children were denouncing their parents. There was just uh, a riot of fear and chaos in the country. And then finally Mao dies and there was a sense of, of exhaustion. The gang of four, as they became known, were four leaders close to Mao, including Jianqing, his wife. They were kicked out of the party. Uh, Jianqing would be sent to prison for life, and she would be released on health reasons in 1991, where she would commit suicide. The art that emerges from this time is kind of in a state of shock. Uh, and a sense of bewilderment. Uh, the ideology that gripped the country was suddenly shattered and a deep kind of cynicism kept in. While no one would directly criticize Mao and his policies, there was a kind of hedging that said, well, there may be some of those ideas that we need to reconsider. And so we see this painting by Gao Xiaohua Wai, which shows the Red Guard after a battle with each other, looking distraught, confused, forlorn, wounded. Here's a really powerful image by Liao Bingxiang. I had mentioned this cartoonist before. He was the artist who came up with the series of The Cat Kingdom, which he did for a personal exhibition. He was heavily criticized during the Cultural Revolution and had to practice this self-deprecation. A lot of his works were destroyed. And so here he shows himself sort of in this sort of fetal crouch, still in the shape of the container he had been put in, even though the container the forces that kept him in that shape are gone. He still is afraid to move out and change. And so there is this kind of way in which the country didn't quite know how to behave or what to think at the end of the Cultural Revolution. Here is uh, a painting that stirred quite a lot of interest from 1980. It was a painting just of uh, a farmer that Luo Shongli saw, and he painted this man. And then when it was exhibited, it was given the title Father. Uh, and it was this sort of non-ideological image. He was not a kind of happy, brilliant-faced, young, vibrant villager. Here was a really weathered worn and rather aged person. This really looked like what people really looked like, a kind of criticism of the past, showing how far people had come from really looking at what peasants actually looked like. The legacy of Mao is complicated. He still is and holds a power over much of the country in People still, in many places, revere him in a, as a kind of deity. Uh, there was in the region of Henan a giant statue that was just erected not too long ago in 2016. Um, the local uh, wealthy entrepreneur raised the cash and they 
began constructing this. Uh, and, but before they had released the scaffolding, uh, they were news of this huge statue came to Beijing and they said, stop, you do not have permission to build this. You have to take it down. So it was barely finished and it was summarily taken down. And again, it shows you this sort of strange legacy of what to do about Mao. Mao, who caused so much pain, was the author of so many atrocities and so much death and destruction, and yet also was the founder of the Chinese Communist Party. And so what to do with Mao is still an open question.